<laughs> okay, I give up. Uh, okay, I think you can kill the music, guys. <laughs> now we'll kill the party. That was nice to be in the conservatory, though, wasn't it? Yes. Oh, it's fantastic, isn't it? What a great space and wine and everything. Um, so, I, I, <laughs> hello online. I'm being blinded by uh, a light straight in my head. But um, welcome to the Barbican, welcome to the Frobisher Rooms, and welcome to this conversation, uh, which is part of a series of the Gen uh, Genesis Foundation Network conversations, in conversations, looking at broadly at the arts and society and how, what we need to do and how we need to do it to, to change things a little bit. Uh, and just talking to the team at Genesis uh, over the last month or so, it's like, let's do another one, let's do it at the Barbican, and then what should we make it about? And the Gen Genesis Foundation, when it was set up by John Studinsky, the banker, some 20 years ago, I think, Harry, um, has put so much money into the arts, but it's built this thing called a network. So there is a Gen Gen Genesis Foundation network, and some people here have been and the beneficiaries of that network. Uh, and it made me sort of think about a conversation I had with a rapper when I was at the BBC years ago uh, called Chipmunk, or now Chip. And I was just sort of discussing with him about how he developed his career. And he said, well, he kind of followed Dizzy, and Dizzy beat a path, and he could follow that, and then Tiny Temper followed that. And he said, basically, they were, he created, Dizzy created this network which enabled all of them to have a career in music which they wouldn't have had otherwise. And it sort of dawned on me then just how powerful and how important networks are uh, for everybody and each and every one of us. And actually, uh, when I was reading Stormzy's book about his approach to the arts and what he's trying to create with his uh, investments in the Cambridge student uh, um, bursary and all the rest of it, is to create another network. So it seemed to me that in this moment in time where lots of arts institutions are trying to address endemic problems, historical problems around equity, diversity and inclusion, that it'd be a really good moment actually just to discuss networks. Because if there aren't any networks, if there aren't the pathways, nothing's going to change. So we invited six brilliant people, honestly, <laughs> brilliant people with slightly different perspectives to discuss networks, how you create them, how you maintain them, what's the point of them, what's bad practice, what's good practice, and how the right network done in the right way with the right combinations can actually change society in a really profound manner. So that's the topic. Uh, I think it's going to be really interesting, hopefully something of a, a masterclass. Um, and, then, and then there's questions afterwards. And then there's like this, it pips up for it. There's this like live networking thing in the room. If you, I'm, I'm not sure if people had enough wine, really. Fit, but, um, it's not like a dating thing, don't worry. It's nothing, no, nothing weird. Um, OK, so what I want you to do is just give a very warm welcome. I'm going to introduce each, each of our panellists individually. I don't, I don't have bifocals, by the way. You know, so that's why I'm doing that. Um, too cheap, I'm afraid. I'm too cheap, not bifocals. Bifocals are really expensive. <laughs> Um, so, yes, so start, I'm just going to read them in the order that they are on my paper. So we're going to start with Sue Emmers, who is the Associate Artistic Director at the Young Vic. Sue. <laughs> and Jack Gamble, who is not any relation to Ed Gamble whatsoever, so don't expect jokes, um, is the Director and CEO of Campaign for the Arts. Jack. Pip Jameson is the founder and CEO of The Dots. Pip. <laughs> Shani Mears is head of talent and co-founder of the agency The Elephant Room. Shani. <laughs> uh, Jamie Nojoko Goodwin is the chief executive, is chief executive of UK Music. Big hand for Jamie, please. <laughs> And lastly, but like way not least, Audrey, is Audrey Solver, who is a founder of Black Creators Matter. Audrey. <laughs> That's a hell of a panel. That's an amazing panel. Thank you all for, for coming along and doing this session. Um, I think the best place to start with, and I'm going to start with you, Pip, because you're right in the middle. What in your mind? Well, just tell us a bit about the dots, actually. Just a little bit. Don't bore us. Um, <laughs> but just a little bit about the dots. And then what in your mind is a network? 
Uh, yeah, so yeah, my name is Pip Jamieson. I founded The Dots. Um, so we're a professional networking solution for the creative industries. We started by building our own network, which is nearly a million members, but we now license our technology to other networks who use us. Um, what is a network to me? I mean, a network equals opportunities, right? It was so funny when I started The Dots, we were actually all about jobs. And then we quickly realized that 50 to 80% of jobs get filled through a network. So about three years ago, we literally replatformed to make it all about networking. And yeah, networking is kind of power over time. Okay. Sorry, so that's, that's very... <laughs> that's, uh, heavy. Yeah, yeah that's but it, it, it is. And I guess that's why we always tried to make it accessible to everyone. Um, and that's really why we started The Dots, was to try and open up opportunities to everyone to try and break down those barriers. So just briefly, how does the dots work for those who don't know? I think the most important thing is we, our algorithm is actually based on positivity and kindness, which sounds a bit gushy, but it, it has led to a really safe environment where you can connect with anyone that you want to connect with or ask questions that you want to get help with. And I think that's what I hated about LinkedIn is it's very much about you have your network and you maintain that network. But what if you don't already have that network? and LinkedIn's algorithm is based around like if you went to Oxford or Cambridge and the networks you have already, but we wanted to do the opposite, which was enable a place where you could connect and meet and um, just basically build a network if you don't already have one. Okay. Thanks very much, Pip. Um, Shani, you co-founded The Elephant Room, which is you're not here just to do advertising, right? You're here to change it. That's the tagline. And full disclosure, Shani in the Elephant Room, I've invited to the Barbican to work with us, and they are brilliant. And I haven't got any shares or anything like that. <laughs> um, but what really struck me about the Elephant Room and what Shani and Dan did when they founded it is it is like a completely different model for an advertising agency. Uh, so most ad agencies have a couple of creatives, and then they hire different people to do different bits and pieces. Whereas Shani's built this network called um, the guest list. Uh, and just tell us a bit about the guest list, Shani, and what the idea about it is, and, and what, what, what problem was it fixing? Yeah, so, so hey everyone, I'm Shani. Um, so essentially the guest list was, for me, it was about access and being able to access things regardless of where you come from, regardless of who you know, regardless of how you speak, etc. because a lot of the time I was a part of things where I felt like if I didn't identify as say a woman then I didn't have access to a certain community or if um, I had to be black and brown to be a part of another community which is great because those communities serve a, um, a very specific purpose but actually if you're just someone who's curious and you're just trying to learn a bit about people or you're trying to access maybe a report that you've never seen before or go to an event that you've never you've never known before where, where would you go for that? Do you know what I mean? So the guest list, essentially, everyone's always trying to be on the guest list. <laughs> and the guest list is about access for all people, all places. So it's an opportunity space for people to connect. And the only thing that you have to be is of value. And I believe that everyone has some form of value to give. So as long as you're not there, just not just there to take and you're willing to share, that is where it exists. So it exists in a forum space and there are probably about 2,000 people where we scroll swap, people share events, people share um, contacts, people share reports, um, casting call-outs, etc. And then also people recruit. And essentially, by default, it's also made up of people who are predominantly non-white because you often find when it comes to certain communities or different groups that are often underrepresented, they don't have the access. And that is what we're trying to fill as an agency also, making sure that when we're looking at access and representation, it's across the board and it's not just specific to a certain type of person or a certain type of capability. But actually, it's for people who have value and they get given a chance. Really. How does, how does it work, Shani? And, and how do you manage it? How do you, everybody wants to get on the guest list. How do you get on the guest list? And then how do you, how do you manage it or don't you manage it? Is it like completely organic? So yeah, currently, so it's, it's organic and it exists um, in like an email forum. So um, I manage it on a day to day and you have to either be invited in um, by someone who's already in the guest list, so like recommended, or you can just apply through your, um, through your Google forum and then you can enter a group. So people who are in groups and that. And then essentially the idea is to be a part of that, see 
like see what's happening and then whatever it is that you either find interesting or the people that you connect with you take it offline so you then connect with them in real life or you connect separately outside of the guest list does it get bigger than 2000 yeah it, yeah it's, it grows daily to be honest <laughs> it grows daily like i think i'm adding on, on average about 10 to 20 people a day so yeah it, it just it just grows over time and naturally people like recommend but the one thing is if you do apply and you just put your name you won't get accepted in because the idea is is that you have some form of value so you have to say i'm a photographer looking to network with x and then that's how you get in and can you track how much work and how, what the, the connections and yeah, what those so, connections then deliver so we often like well i say often but from time to time we put out um like a, like a survey essentially and people will fill that in so based on how many opportunities they've got or where they come from what part of the world they're in um, and then we've also got like certain testimonies from different people who have talked about how the guests have supported them so jenny has got loads of clients including art and converse and also and uber loads of different brands and the guest list get to work with us so you're you're a, you know you're a conduit to that creativity aren't you and you just you put it out there you know, it's like it's like so not what ad agencies used to do. You know, they used to get somebody with like some expensive star and all that. But you you do it completely the other way around. Is it's like here's a barbican opportunity. Who wants to have a go at it? Yeah, essentially. And that's yeah. why everybody wants to be on the guest <laughs> list because it's, it's really good. Uh, Jamie, let's um yeah 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 you are Audrey. I know you are. Um, so Jamie, just to think about music. I mean, I was talking about in the Dizzy Rascal example of those networks. From a UK music point of view, uh, what, what what do networks mean to you, and how do you how, how do you operate them successfully? Because there's like there are so many. There are hundreds. <laughs> Um, and actually the whole point of UK music was actually born out of because there were so many networks. Mm -hmm. So in the music industry, there are so many associations, there's bodies, um, there's trade unions, there's trade bodies, there's associations that represent all different bits of the music industry and they all do fantastic work for their members. But it sort of meant that you had a bit that represented venues, a bit that represented orchestras, a bit that represented musicians, a bit that represented songwriters, I could go on and on and yeah. on. And the problem was you had all these networks but there wasn't actually a, kind of a collective voice. Um, there's that famous story about uh, Kissinger said, the problem with Europe is that when I want to speak to Europe, who do I pick up the phone to? <laughs> and it was sort of, there was a sense that there's the same for lots of industries, not just the music industry. When you wanted to have a view of the entire music industry, where would you sort of go? So UK Music was actually set up about 15 years ago to be that conduit for government, for the media, um, for the public sometimes, um, to be able to take the view of the entire sector and present a view um, from all these networks, almost like a super network, um, almost. So you find yourself often having to sometimes split the difference, sometimes work out what's better for the industry as a, as a whole. But it's a good example of how networks are fantastic and got all sorts of positive benefits, but also there's the drawback sometimes of networks, which is they can become siloed um, and they can become in their own, um, in their own sort of view sometimes. So you sometimes need to be taking a step outside and trying to work out how to link up these different networks and make sure that you can be drawing those positive lessons from one and drawing them across the whole sector as a whole. That's right. And I just wanted, on that point, I wanted to ask you, Sue, because you could say, I mean, it strikes me anyway, that like within the art, some of those networks have become ossified, become really stuck. So you just get the same people being employed from the same sort of background, doing the same sort of thing. Um, and then, that, and, and which you know creates a sort of, you know a narrowness of talent and obviously a narrowness of opportunity, which is one of the things you wanted to tackle, didn't you, with with the network you were, you've curated at the the Young Vic? Yes, I mean we're really proud of our network, uh, funded by the Genesis Foundation. Got two thousand people. But then I meet people and Chani is like, oh wow, you've really got a network. Um, so we've got kind of 2000 artists, producers on a network. And I guess the thing that we wanted to break down was that sense of being in the right place at the right time, knowing the right things. And we wanted transparency, we wanted a community, we wanted a sense of connectivity. And so that everything we do at the Young Vic, like 93% of our artist development is sent out to everybody and then people express an interest. And then anybody that expresses an interest, we meet everybody and it's not paper based, it's person based. So it's kind of trying to expand as far as we can who we meet, how we meet those people and always evolving those processes by 
the transparency of kind of hopefully at the Young Vic. And the, the, we'll never achieve that because we don't have enough jobs, we don't have enough opportunities, but at least we're endlessly meeting people to then connect them to, to other opportunities, to, to other artists themselves. And I think the thing that we felt really important, if it's not, not going off the point, is that as an organisation of our size, we cannot service 2,000 people. But what we can do is create a community where they can kind of horizontally mentor each other and therefore, rather than always looking upwards for the people that are going to help um, develop you or give you skills, you look to each other and you create a community that you're going to find peers, find a tribe, find a family. And that seems to be the best way to break it down because you're giving people agency as opposed to being the gatekeeper. So, just, so, so we're clear, you, you've got your network of 2000 practitioners within the theatre. Every time you want a new play, every time you want a set it's, design, you put, it, you put it out there? It's within our artist development. So in terms of what we've now got is an open submissions policy. So on our website, you can go in and you can sort of like um, say an idea that you've got or a project. And we're just developing how we make that more open and more accessible. Um, but again, we've got to be realistic. We make kind of six to seven shows a year. So for, for six to seven shows a year, 2000, your network is offered the opportunity. No. <laughs> it would be lovely if it did, but we'd be sitting there meeting 2,000 people. Well, that's what time. I thought it would, yeah. yeah. No, so I think it's more to do in terms of where our artist development sits, and then we have to have the realisation of what it means to then create the work. But those people, because we've been doing this for 20 years, yeah. so there are artists um, like uh, Ola Ince, Kate Hewitt, who started back in our open um, introduction to directing, who have now made work on the main stage. So I think the other thing is it's about consistency of approach. And therefore, you can access it at any point, but that you've got to know that what you're um, opening the door so you can then realise later down the line. So what does it, you know, if I'm a user, what does, what does the network look like? The network, the easiest way to describe it is Facebook before Facebook, but without the online trolling or the algorithms. <laughs> so that um, basically everybody has a profile, there's 2,000 people. Um, you can search according to skill sets, uh, level of experience, where you're based. And so basically it's a community that can communicate with each other, but also for us as a, a creative organization, we can then um, send out information and send out information for other organizations that are offering directing opportunities or assistant directing opportunities. And also those members can talk online to each other and raise topics, ask for help, communicate individually. And so everything that we do through the Young Vic, like um, workshops, assistant directorships, the Genesis uh, Future Directors Award, we send it out to that group of people and then also amplify that through social media. So the same question as I had for Shani is how do you get into your network? How do you get to it, be one of those? It's open access to anybody. It's all free. Anybody in this room to sign Anybody, up. if you consider yourself um, an originator of uh, live performance, uh, whether you're a designer, director, writer, a uh, performer who originates, it's open to anybody, everything is free. When we've got um, opportunities like the Genesis Future Directors Award, assisting directing, training assistant directorships, you're paid. So it's sort of, we tried to create a, a kind of like a pathway that you can, you don't have to go from the beginning to the end. And but do, you then, have, do you have to have been to college and all that? Sort of no, no, no. We actively kind of seek out people who've not gone through those traditional routes. So we've got some, something called Introduction to Making, which we do with our taking part department that works um, with local community, with schools, with colleges, with local young people. So we're sort of trying to reach out as far as we can so that, yeah, you know, you can go to university and do an MA, but that's not wow. solely where we're trying to encourage people to join from. Who knew about this? A few. Yeah. <laughs> Who's going to sign up to it? I know, I know, what an amazing thing. That's, Sue, that's an extraordinary achievement. How do you maintain it? How do you keep it, how do you keep it going? Um, consistency of offer. I think um, when we started, there were so many things that, um, I think networks are really interesting. They start for the minute and there's a great flurry of interest and sometimes it's uh, related to funding and Harriet and the Genesis Foundation have been with us for 20 years. So it's that. Where, where, that, where do you need the money? Well, you need the money in order to kind of like make the offer. So the network itself, but having a network that then doesn't do something, it can just be a group of people who come together and then think, why do we keep coming together? So it's like all of these folks are doing things beyond having a network. And the network is itself is the, the conduit, but then you've got to have activity. So you've got to have something that is what people want, and therefore you've got to talk to your network about what they want. And then if you continue to listen to them and be very much led by what they need whilst thinking about what your theatre needs, then that will continue to be a conversation as opposed to, here you go, we're doing this, do you want it? 
Okay, final question, we've got to move on, but it's, 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 it's exceptional what you've done here. Do, is it a closed network or could you connect it to Shani's network? Yeah, I mean, it's really fascinating because it's kind of, I guess within theatre and no disrespect to theatre is that we can be quite inward looking, whereas just talking to Pip in terms of who they've got on a different networks and how that works and kind of the creatives that, that you've kind of described to me is phenomenal. It's like theatre needs to break out of itself and the more that we can connect to different creatives. And, you know, at the minute we used to be the director's programme, brilliant under David Lan, and now under Kwame Kweomar with the creator's programme. So it's kind of looking at not nouns like I'm a director or writer or performer, it's I direct. I kind of perform, I write, I kind of do podcasts. It's kind of saying it is what you do, not how you define yourself, because one day you can wake up and want to do a podcast, the next you want to do a WhatsApp thriller, and then the day after that you want to do Hamlet. And that, that's kind of the amazing mix. And so we're responding to what artists want, and that feels really exciting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. brilliant, Sue. Um, Audrey, uh, you set up Black Creators Matter having been at YouTube as one of the, the programmers there for YouTube Europe. And now you've set up this network, which, judging from my conversation last week, has an international dimension. You're now in Senegal, is, is that...? Yeah, it's is, correct, is, yes. So I'm yeah, between London what, and Dakar. What, yeah, I know, it's lovely to have you here. What, what, what's the idea behind your network? And how do you start a network from scratch? I might not be the right person to talk about how I started because it was really not the plan. <laughs> it was really like I wanted to do a production for people to see the work of creators that we needed to be seen and to be heard. And then from the production, the creators were like, what are we doing now? <laughs> and then I had to basically create this platform, but I was not alone. I was really supported by creators, the creators that I met for my journey at YouTube. But what happened when I left YouTube, a lot of creators were like, we need your support. What can we do? Can you please book us to a production studio? Like basic stuff, but they didn't have access anymore. So I just felt like, I felt I was, I felt like as a black woman, and yes, the network is really black creators matter, is really focused on the, my black creatives. But at the time I was the only black woman working there a few years ago, a lot of things have changed since, but I felt like maybe the black community was a bit more comfortable to come talk to me. And, um, and you know, like there is also a big difference, you know, when you're a creator from the person that you see online that could be really bubbly, really ongoing, and the person that you see in real life. So sometimes good to go and ask, you know, for support, for help, or even for just, you know, like for advice, it could be really difficult. And I felt like I could be this person, uh, maybe of the status that I had at the time. But when I left, I think we still had conversations. And till now, you know, I, work, I still work with a lot of creators from my YouTube days. And I left YouTube a long time ago. <laughs> but yes, yeah, so, but this is how basically the network started. A lot of meetings with, like, I think 10 to 15 creators on a weekly basis. Um, what are we going to do? How are we going to make it happen? And basically, this is how I started. So I like to say that I've recreated it with others. It was just not me and myself and I. But I think the reason was I am I was not a creator at the time. So that's why they were like, just do it, do the be the businesswoman that you are. And um, and yes, and this is how we we started. So started as first like a networking platform to really support you know fund educational project and program. And then uh, we kind of evolve as a creative agency where we respond to briefs for creatives. And then the pandemic has changed also a lot of things, even for myself and the creators, uh, the way that we see life and we see things are a bit different. Then I kind of evolve also like bringing the work in Africa. I'm also a producer working a lot on the ground. And I just realized I was working a lot and bringing the UK crew with me. Yeah. when I felt like I could train as well people on the ground on production, storytelling, and everything that I do. And this is where I started. So we started last year in Lagos uh, with one of our programs. And we're now in Senegal and basically trying to be like everywhere, like so between London over there. And I'm Caribbean, so I'm also trying to focus as well the Caribbean. But it's a lot like the black creators are everywhere. And so the network, I, I started with the numbers as well, like a number of 2,000 people, but then I don't really have like the proper number because I see like 
numbers coming from different parts of the world, so it's a bit difficult to really quantify. Um, but they are around, and I think the network is not global. That's super interesting because you, Shani, and Sue all have a network of around 2,000 people. Sure. Is that a thing? Is, <laughs> Is that, like, is, that why, is that the moment it stops? That's, like, that's, that's the scale you can get to is it, when you're running it so individually as each one of you are before it can become 20,000 or 200,000 or 2 million. Is, is 2,000 like the limit, you think? Is it, because it seems to be more than a coincidence. I think it's probably the point, though, isn't it? Where you get to like probably like 2,000, 3,000, you're like, okay, I can't, I can't no longer do this just me or just like a small team. You probably need to get like... Engineers and build out some form of like process where there's a UX to it and people can just access it without you having to actually manage it. Surely there is a number and it probably is 2000. I don't know, but I feel like it must it must be. But I mean, you're yeah, on a million. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. we, were, we were chatting about that um, before. Um, so we found the tipping point for it to be a network is about a thousand plus. And the reason being is only one to five percent of people ever post on the network. So most people what are like one to five percent no. ever post. Wow. So quick hands up who this week posted on social media. Put your hands up. OK, so it's actually more. You're more yeah. active. Um, <laughs> brilliant. Um, but yeah. So it's usually one to five percent, and actually Facebook spent years trying to get it over the five percent. So if you have a network of only a hundred people, that means only say one to five people are posting a week. So optimal networks are a thousand above, but once you get to about five thousand, they stop becoming networks; they just become broadcast channels. Um, so then the the optimal thing to do is then sub subdivide it into sub networks with community leads of those sub networks. And anything under a thousand should be more in a group format, but actually groups up until a hundred. If anyone's been on a WhatsApp group between a hundred and thousand people, it's hideous. <laughs> so there's this really awkward point of the network between around a hundred and thousand people. So there is like maths. Sorry, I'm a tech geek. Mm -hmm. but, um, <laughs> there is maths it's around networks. Um, but what's amazing is these are kind of optimal size networks for an individual to manage, but then you need community leads to manage networks within networks, if that makes sense. Sorry, geek, yeah. geek, geeked out then. No, that's a good explanation. Thank you. I'm maths, <laughs> that's great. Uh, Jack, let's just talk about the network you've built, which came out of the pandemic. Um, and was you sort of did it independently, and then, and then it became part of the Campaign for the Arts, which mm. has been a, an arts lobby group for about 20, 25 years. Just to, to take us through, through that story and then sure. sp specifically what you were trying to achieve. Sure. So the Campaign for the Arts is a grassroots network of uh, now a quarter of a million people across the UK. We exist to champion and defend and expand access to the arts for the public, but also crucially with the public. And um, we formed in the first lockdown, as you say, when COVID hit. Campaign for the Arts didn't? Well, no, the, my involvement started then, oh, yeah. yeah. So at the time I was actually working at a theatre in, in Hackney called the Arcola Theatre. And we, like most uh, arts organisations, shut our doors because of COVID. And I got a number of emails from, from people in the community, local people, people who came as audience members or who were part of our community theatre companies, who were concerned about what COVID meant for the theatre and for arts organisations generally. And they wanted to know uh, what's happening and what can we do, if anything, to, to help. And at this time, there had sprung up some really quite brilliant networks in the cultural sector, uh, people sharing information, people talking about the needs and the, the, you know, what, what had to happen. But that information was not really being shared that more widely and I felt that from even just from these emails that I'd received that there was clearly a public interest in what was happening and a desire for people to get involved and so we did the only thing we knew how to do in the pandemic we started the zoom call we decided on the zoom call to do a couple of things we started a video demonstration where we asked members of the public to send us short videos on their phones from home talking about how, how and why they valued the arts, what was at stake for them if local organisations were to collapse because of COVID. And we started a petition which amplified a lot of those needs and concerns that were coming out of the cultural sector and mobilised about 150,000 people to urge the government to introduce what became the Culture Recovery Fund. So the final bit of the story is just that we kept going. Um, we've uh, started to expand the network in terms of number of people, but also our focus. 
uh, we've started to take in issues like arts education and also funding of the arts at local government level. And uh, we're keeping going because, as you probably know, there are no shortage of threats from no shortage of fronts in terms of um, the arts in this country at the moment. I think we're going in the wrong direction, but I think the hope is that well, not, not your network. No, the no. Ne the, I think. <laughs> I'd be clear about that. The, the network is is um, has surprised me and is a source of hope for me because what is clear is even though we are living through a period where public funding of the arts has essentially halved in the past decade, uh, access to the arts in schools is in real crisis. In two thousand and nine, most primary school students in England participated in music activities. By 2020, that figure was 35%. It was around a third. And we know that in private schools, these opportunities are not just being provided, they're being prized. So there's a great amount of inequality. There's, we're going in the wrong direction. But the hope is, a great source of hope to me, is that there, are, there is no shortage of people who really care about that and who don't want it to be like that and who want to bring themselves to a campaign to change that. Great stuff, Jack. And you sound like a brilliant advocate for that argument. <laughs> Um, so campaign for the arts, I know it quite well because I was on once upon a time when I had a fringe, I was on the board, um, and, but it's completely different now. So just just to exp just explain to us if, if you would, because the, the points you make are really important, mm. really really important, uh, but they are points which have been made for a long time. Mm -hmm. So how can bringing a network and all the the, the, the capacity of modern technology to, to link and to amass? How can that network actually achieve some of the things you're describing? Yes, it's a really good question. I think we are a quite interesting combination of old and new in that we are obviously uh, campaigning on issues that are as old as the hills. There have always been issues around access to the arts in this country and in every country. I think what's new about our, what we're doing is, is, is um, the approach that we're taking, which has absolutely come out of a moment uh, in time where we are more networked as a society in terms of digital networks than we have ever been. And the reason we were able to grow uh, the campaign that we were during COVID and the reason we're able now to, to, to involve a quarter of a million people is because of the way in which that more digital network society enables us to inform large numbers of people about issues at the national and the local level. and. Also, because of that more network society, people can take action more easily in ways they couldn't before. So as an example of that, we ran a couple of local campaigns recently uh, because there were proposed cuts by local councils to the arts. One in Nottingham, which is the Labour Council, they wanted to cut funding of uh, arts organisations from 37%, uh, sorry, they wanted to implement a 37% cut. Through activating local supporters of our network there, we were able to bring that down to a 15% cut. And in Windsor and Maidenhead, even better, we turned a proposed 100% cut to the arts there into a 17% increase in local <laughs> arts funding. And we did that. I didn't do that. People did that in our network so how by did taking it, action just, themselves. That sounds terrific, Jack. Just, just visualise that for us, would you? What did it actually look like? It looked like us reaching out to the people who had engaged with the work we were doing to say, did you know that in your local area there is a plan afoot to abolish, in the case of Windsor and Maidenhead, all local funding for your art centres? And is did this you... done through a newsletter or...? Yeah, we, have, we, we email people. We, we don't just email people, we have social media channels, we have other ways of connecting with people, but we send emails to people and anybody can, can join uh, that, that list at campaignforthearts.org. Um, <laughs> But, you know, we email people, we say, did you know this is happening? Did you know these are the consequences? Did you know that you can be involved in uh, an opposition to this by uh, either signing a petition that we might have set up or even better, and very successfully so far for us, by actually engaging in official democratic processes that councils set up to ask for people's involvement, but which very often are underutilised mm. because... So much is going on, people are busy, uh, but people do care. And when they're given the opportunity and they're given the reminder, they act. Great stuff, Jack. Thanks very much. Um, Jamie, one of the points that Jack was alluding to um, was around this notion of privilege and entitlement within the arts. And I sort of mentioned earlier on about this ossified network, which has struck me as, what, why is that the case? And what can be done meaningfully over and above the great work which is being done by everybody on this panel to change it, to, to, to broaden that network? What a question. Well, 
It's fascinating seeing how much that sometimes is perpetuated actually by networks. <laughs> so, for example, in the creative sector, yeah. so often people get a gig because they knew that person, or that person went to school with that person, or they played that ensemble with that person. Yeah, they sort of but that's, that yeah everybody that's, has a network. Everyone right? has a network. Um, but some, so sometimes they can actually be per perpetuated. It. It's almost it's a really difficult question of there's lots of organisations I'm involved in or boards I'm on, and they always say we want to diversify, we want to reach people beyond our networks. How do you reach people beyond our networks? It's really difficult to say, we need people who aren't in our networks. We need to reach out beyond our network, but we don't know how to bring those people in if we don't have any sort of contact with them. Again, even just coming in this pa panel, I'm speaking on this panel because I'm part of a network of people who are involved in this, in this, in this panel. How do you go and reach out to those people who you can't find, who you can't find? And so it can be a real, it can be a real, real challenge sometimes. Um, but I wanted to pick up on a point that Jack was saying, because it's so important there, and it's something that I think we really almost underuse our networks. Um, when you live in a democracy, um, knowing that public care about things is so, 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 so powerful. Um, so I used to work in, um, in politics, in government, and every week an MP will get a briefing on who's written to about something. And they'll kind of get a, a pie chart and they'll say, oh, 30 people have written saying their tax is too, are too high. 20 people have written in saying they're annoyed about the bins not going out. And honestly, I've seen it where sort of an MP will get five letters about some completely issue he's never heard of it or she's never heard of. And they'll go, oh, my God, what's this? And they start to really worry about it. And if you're a local councillor who gets elected on sometimes like a 30 or 40 majority, you get four letters or five letters from someone. Again, don't think of the public or networks as public, think of them as voters. And it's what, what you mobilise so, so effectively, because actually we are, I always think policymakers don't actually appreciate quite how much the public do care about the arts. Um, and there's a mission for all of us to be sort of like really mobilising that and really making that argument and winning that argument, but also just demonstrating that sort of when these things are happening, if you show that they're potentially going to be affecting votes, they can be a vote winner. It has a it has a, it has a real impact. So using these networks, um, again, sometimes at UK Music, one of the things we like to do is reach out to amateur orchestras and just get their like 70 members who are all based in a single constituency to write to their MP about something. And that MP suddenly goes, oh my God, this is a massive issue in our constituency. We've got to start lobbying this minister and that minister on it. And actually in this sector where we do have purchase into so many different networks, there is so much more we probably can be doing on that. It's interesting, it's to Pip's point, isn't it? We, we, it's very easy to get into the, your mind's eye that there is this network called the government, for example, and that the only way to access that network is going in sort of dear prime minister type level which is obviously not really going to work. But as Pip says, when you start that network, it's too big to be managed by one person. You just figure out that it actually goes local. And then eventually, as you've done very successfully, Jack, is you just target an individual who, with a tiny network and overwhelm them. <laughs> um, Sue, I just want to go back to this, the arts point um, with, with you, because you, obviously you've been looking at this problem and trying to fix it. You're trying to make it more accessible, broaden uh, the amount of people who have a chance to work at the, the Young Vic. Why, has a, why is this such an endemic, systemic problem? And how can these networks address it? Um, that's a very big question. Um, I think people protect power. I think they, you get power and you hold on to it. And therefore, you're sometimes not able to want to share it and to recognise that that's both a social um, need and responsibility but it's also a business sense and i think what we've been trying to argue increasingly is that it makes sense because the more people that make work that are representative society the more you reach out to audiences the more that you're then telling the stories that make you relevant to the community that you're trying to reach so i think it's, it doesn't happen because of systemic inequality i mean you know we can go on about that for a long time but that that is fundamentally where the lack of access sits, there is talent. It's just giving that talent the opportunity to express what they want to make and to think about different models of making it. So we're not doing, if you go to university, you think in a certain way and it suddenly becomes like, oh, do you remember in the JCR when we did blah and actually look at people and like, I never went to a JCR, I have no <laughs> idea what you're talking about. So it's kind of that sense of um, thinking that your lived experience is everybody's and then it becomes kind of like a homogenous sense of, um, people feeling excluded because you don't recognize what difference brings and also that not difference that just a different lived experience has um has a way that you can learn and develop what you're doing i'm sure there are others that can speak much more kind of um uh better than i can on that but it it just 
it is about agency, it's about control, it's about power, it's in systemic inequality. So, um, Shani, thinking about your network, uh, I'll talk a bit about how that links back in, but just having set it up and developed it, what are the don'ts? What are, what are the mistakes? What are they like? Because there's lots of people, you know, here who might think, listening to these different networks being set up, crikey, I've got, you know, I want to set up a network for 2,000 people who can, who can work with us in a similar way that you have done in different, you know, in different networks, different communities, and you can, think, you can see the power of them, and Jack's made that completely clear. What are the don'ts, you know? Uh, I mean, I think the way how I sort of see it is a lot, of, a lot of things are about trial and error. So I think don't assume that it's going to work straight away. Like, to your point, Pip, about that 1% to 5%, like that is 100% true. Like, when I initially started the guest list, which was literally just an idea about me thinking about the role that I play as head of talent, but then equally me just thinking about the role that I feel like I play within also the creative, the creative space that I occupy. And I'm like, actually, how am I going to start this? And a lot of the time it was just me sharing stuff like, and people just building that trust. So it's like, don't assume that people are going to trust you straight away because you think you've got a great idea. Like you actually have to have some form of proof of concept. And then there's going to be a time where that's going to that's going to need like building, nurturing, and also that's going to take a long time. So also don't assume that it's going to be successful either next week, next month, next year even. It's going to take a really long time to get to that point. But then also it's like also thinking about, I don't know if this is a don't or a do, to be honest, but it's also thinking about who are the people that you're serving? Because there's a lot of the time, like I've, I've learned this a lot, recently you can't you can't serve everybody and you can't please everybody and you won't be able to speak to every single individual and then serve every single need that they have but what you can do is come to an aligned sort of thinking about what's needed versus what's not needed or where someone where you can advise someone to go for this if this is not quite right and i always say the guess this isn't for everybody if it ain't for you it ain't for you right <laughs> and i'm okay with that and i feel like there's a lot of that is like to your point as well so letting it go of like power and ego and stuff like there's some people that have come to me and said oh, i want to be removed i'd like i no longer want to be a part of that that's absolutely okay but that's like one to every 20 people that are joining joining so it's about making sure that when you're building you don't get like i suppose like disheartened or offended in the process if it doesn't fit a certain shoe for somebody or because you're not gonna it's not one size fits all kind of vibe and I also think, again, I don't know if it's a don't or a do, <laughs> but the, when, you're, when you're thinking about like um, networks and you're thinking about communities, um, to, your, to your point, Jamie, around like, actually, it is about the people. It no longer becomes about you. So it is about being able to say, what what do you guys want and it it literally will not move it will not grow will not like will not build if the people do not have a voice and i feel like if you don't if you're not somebody that's able to serve people then again it's not for you because i've been a part of networks that are quite badly run to be honest and i don't feel like it served me therefore i've removed myself from that and i feel like if you're if you're running something it's about being able to say okay how do i give over that agency in order for it to grow and i don't think everyone always gets that so i've learned that definitely just by like listening to people or hearing why people choose to leave or hearing why people sort of join this network over another or why they favor something over another and i think it's just about learning how to navigate that space and not becoming too offended but then equally being able to give over the power and say okay you guys you guys do this better than me, so let me let let me listen. This notion is that like you you don't own it; it's not yours. It belongs to you. you it belongs to the network. As soon as the network is yeah. established, the network owns the network. Yeah, exactly. Correct. Yeah, I mean, what's interesting? I mean, the most brilliant thing about everyone on this panel is there is a very clear purpose for each of your networking exists and it's funny sometimes we work with networks and they don't have a purpose they just want to network <laughs> and you're like oh so the the why and the who it's for is the most important community because you need to mobilize people around that 
mission. But I think the other misconception is that it just happens. It doesn't. It takes time. It takes nurturing. It takes trust. It takes trial and error. Like what works with one will completely not work with another and it's kind of fail. And, and I think that's a kind of everyone's like, yeah, I need a network. And I think there's also a really important definition between there's networks that are communities and there's networks that are broadcast networks, right? So a network that a community, the community talk to each other, things like Instagram, those are just broadcast networks. That's a net, that's a following. And that can work for a purpose of mobilizing people around a cause. But if you're trying to build a community, you want them talking to each other. And so you kind of need to also decide what is the business objective or what is the purpose of your network to be able to determine, am I wanting to build a community? that actually talks to each other or am I just trying to communicate shit to them? Mm. Sorry. Um, and those are different tacks and those are different like platforms. Those are different solutions and the community that talks to each other, then it's very nuanced in terms of how are they getting value, listening, loving your DMS and listening and just, also taking the criticism, which yeah. I still get really upset with we but I'm just, <laughs> but you, it's really important to yeah. get it and learn and iterate from that. So what, what, Audrey, what are you trying to build with, with, with your network? I mean, is it really as ambitious? You're trying to build a network of creatives across continents? It is actually, <laughs> yes, it is. So really the idea would be for me to make sure that People, they know that there is a pool of creators and creatives. So to your point as well, I had to also realize who was my audience. I like to say creators, but then it becomes really the creative you know, ecosystem. And then for people basically to work more with creators. So for instance, I'm also an events producer. So when I work, what I've tried to do is really to not, not even try, I'm doing it. I'm really bringing people from my network to be able to be to work with me and to basically have jobs. That was not really the first purpose, but really like what I'm trying to do is really making sure that the creators, they get all the tools to basically go out there and be happy, create fun jobs and also, but also be happy. Being a creative is really difficult. You know, sometimes you're alone, you're, you're, you're creating on your own in your bedroom and then, um, you're just going for a photo shoot for like two hours and then you just go home, you edit. It could be really lonely. And so I'm really trying to, for this community also to network. So we used, that was before the pandemic, but we used to do events every single month for them to network, whether it was a networking event, whether it was screening, whether it was a panel discussion, but just to have this moment of basically meeting other creators because you need to be able to meet people like you who think also like you to also also sometimes being more like uh, inspired and want also to move forward. So this network is really like a way to be inspired with the program that we are doing together. Like, yes, because we haven't mentioned that yeah. we have a program with BBC Talent Works, BBC Readers and The Barbican. It was really what we wanted to do. The program is called In The Mix and it was really to bring creators to for them to learn storytelling in short film and this is what they are doing right now they've got this program for six months where basically they're working with talented people and then i want them to be really confident and create their first movie to have its screen and then it just you know like we had the photo shoot few, few weeks ago here at the Barbican and just seeing them happy and being a part of the project. We had a lot of applicants and it was so hard. It was really hard for me to pick like five creators because uh, I like them all. I read like the whole the applications, <laughs> but um, it's really to basically create a momentum. A lot of creators were like, we haven't been chosen, but they still contacted me to see like if there are other opportunities out there. And this is also what I'm trying to do. I'm, I'm trying really to be like the closest to the community. Um, everybody has my phone number, my email. <laughs> so, um, and, and yes, they, so it's really like, um, and it's fascinating as well. There's something with the community when you see what they're doing and how passionate, but also the trust that they built in me to also help them in their career. And this is something I think we should really like be conscious when you create a, a, a network. 
really like, as I mentioned earlier, was really not like the goal to create the network, but now that it's been there, when I remember when we did a launch party, I just did this in white, come, launch of the Black Panthers Matter, there's not really planned and so on, but everybody was there. And I was like, okay, now we have to do something and to make it happen. And, um, and yes, yeah, so um, a network, it takes time. Yes, that's true, it takes time, but also, we also need to make sure that we are creative ourselves with, within our network because things go fast and creators and creatives always need our support and ideas and there's, yeah. a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a flip side to that of, kind of talking about the need for to have networks made up of like-minded people who can sort of support each other and be kind of yeah quite like-minded um i'm all fascinated by how sometimes the most effective networks are actually people who aren't like-minded um, and it, it sort of goes two ways, doesn't it? Because I mean, there are some things that sort of I've been involved in, which are all people from a very same sort of space. It can get a bit of an echo chamber sometimes. And it does go back to the point about, do you want your network to be a community? Do you want it to be a, a pressure group? Or do you want it to be sort of like an ideas generation? But sometimes the networks where you've got a creative person there, an accountant there, a lawyer there, a sports person there, an astrophysicist there, they all come at things from completely different directions, but suddenly you have all these ideas fizzing and all these kind of different perspectives can sometimes be just as effective as bringing together a lot of people from the, from the same sort of background. And, and the other thing, I mean, just looking at Shani there, is, is the, the, the fact, you know, the best networks probably aren't passive, they're active. So, Shani, you are a one woman active network. <laughs> So I get you, I'll get notes from Shani, you should see this person, you should hear from this person. Shani introduced me to Audrey. Audrey introduced me to the BBC. We then set up this thing and, that, and Audrey's network comes in and blah, blah, blah. And it works. So I think there is this notion, isn't there, um, Pip, about the, 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 it's not, a, you know, on the whole, these networks aren't there to be latent and passive. That you, they need to, they, they, there needs to be a way of activating them. You need to put energy into them. Yeah, and it's, it, the energy actually happens a lot at the beginning um, and so a healthy network you should never talk about members you should talk about the engagement of the members so how often are they coming back and a healthy network at the beginning obviously everyone signs up so everyone's engaged and then how do you build that kind of value over time so quick question who in the room runs a network couple people who in the room is interested in building a network yeah, okay, cool. Um, so just before I go off onto a whole spiel. Um, so yeah, I mean, the, the, the reality with then sort of building those networks is back to the purpose. Do you want kind of diverse people in there? Um, I'm dyslexic. I've now completely forgotten your question. <laughs> they need energy. They need energy. But also you can actually, the most important thing is the energy comes from you a lot in the beginning, but then it's actually about finding community leads within your communities to then also bring the energy so when we train networks it's pretty much from all the mistakes i made when i was building my own network because i was doing so much myself in those early days but now it's about how do you identify people within your community who then can become community leads because communities need if someone's DMing you, you have to get back. I now have a full-time person who does that. I'm so sorry if you've got a message from me, that wasn't me, but, <laughs> um, but that you need to get back to them. So actually empowering your community to then lead different communities is a really good way to do that. But you can put those sort of building blocks in place at the early and we, stage. And we've talked about access a lot. What about, sorry, Shani. I was, I was just gonna say, I think as well, I think I look at that from an individual perspective sometimes as well, because I think, as a individual who is an active network, like you said, um, I'm quite passionate about connecting people, making sure that people feel like they get empowered or they get the right opportunities or they're at least put in the right direction in order to get to the objective or whatever they're trying to be. But I feel like that's why I always say, like it is about that value exchange because when you invite people into their network and they see so much of what they're getting out of, they're so much more inclined to then tell their friend and then their friend gets it and then their friend says, oh yeah, me too. And then it becomes this thing where you no longer even have to really do the talking because the activity of the network is working so well that you then, okay, you, the passion that you had or have is it's just been amplified, but it's not based on you just talking about it. There's active opportunity happening so people can talk about what they've got. So I think it's also about being able to identify individuals generally that are 
that are really keen to connect others. So I feel like because I, because often, and a lot of people talk about it, well, I talk about it a lot with my friends that it's that, that gatekeeping thing where people get to a certain level or they get to a certain space where it's like, okay, yeah, now it's just for us five and we only want to like mobilize between us and it's the opportunities are only for us. And it's just like, that's weird, firstly. But <laughs> it's, it's about being able to like, okay, after us five have got this opportunity, how do we then put this experience out to 10 more people? And after that 10, how does it become 20? After 20, how does it become 200? And I think that's what I'm more interested in is how does the opportunity that you've experienced and the empowerment that you've experienced, how does that live in other people beyond just yourself? And what I love about, sorry, what I love about what you've done is we, we talk a lot about show, not tell. You can tell a community how to behave or what to do. They never do it that way. <laughs> um, but what you're showing is you're showing you doing it and then it's empowering the other community to live the same thing and do the same thing and that then just becomes viral and that's yeah. it's so lovely when that community kind of starts to get that traction because yeah. it's literally oh i saw this person post this oh i'll post this and they got you know x amount of replies oh i could post something similar like that and then that's where you suddenly see these just, just want to just ask a, a vulgar question which is money um so i Shani, you're running a business um, and so, so you, Pip. So, 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 how does that how does that work? So, so, yeah, how does that work, Shani? So, for us at the moment, the there's no like subscription to it or anything. And I think this goes back to the point of like, at what point does it become a bigger that like, business proposition and stuff? But I suppose the way how we see it is that um, at the Elephant Room, I'm head of talent, and a lot of my role is about community building and a lot of what we're selling into our clients is communities. So when we're, when we're talking about the different communities that we have access to, or when we're talking about the different people that we have access to, a lot of that sits within the networks that we have, and then obviously then allows you to sell it back in based on whatever you're trying to achieve or the numbers. So to actually exist in the network, you don't, you don't have to pay, which I think is another conversation that people should be talking about as well, because a lot of the time people pay to be a part of networks, and the moment you put a price on something, there is some level of inaccessibility to that because it's like when you go to an event and you see it's like four hundred pound for a ticket. You're like, who's got four hundred pound? Do you know what I mean? So of course there's going to be a closed off network there, and I think so. For us, it's important. Okay, the the mobilisation and like I was saying, what does the community need? Is the opportunities that are getting put in there for our clients? What do they need? And they need those communities. Therefore, they need to pay for that because they have the money. So it's like being able to like navigate it in that way whereby people are still being served and we're still obviously making bread. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Right. Um, questions. Who would like to ask the question? A, can we wait for a mic just so um, people online can, can hear you? That's very kind. Thank you. Thanks. Um, yeah, just on that one. Is it Shani? Shani. Um, first, thank you all. This has been really, um, yeah, informative. Um, it was on that point, actually, just before you asked that question about what does it actually look like to offer value as like an instigator of a network? Um, because it's sounding like for it to be an effective, net, effective network, it has to involve some sort of financial uh, <laughs> stability um, or some connections yourself or uh, some kind of power in the area that you're trying to affect. And if you don't have those things, how can you sort of, yeah. Um, and my friend started a network recently, a black, black costume network, and it does cost money to join. And when she told me, I was a bit like, oh, sis, like <laughs> I was gonna close off a lot of people. But she said that she had to do that to fund the types of projects that they wanted to immobilize the people within the network to have. So it's just that kind of like, yeah, um, murky ground of accessibility, yes, but also if you want to offer the opportunities and the value, um, how do you do that without financial, yeah, security? Yeah. Okay, so to your friend or, or to yourself based on the question, it is, it is a little bit like a chicken and egg. However, you do need to have a level of belief in what you're bringing to the table. So for example, if your friend's building a, a network and she's charging people for it, me as someone who's going into that network, I need to know exactly what I'm paying for. 
and in, in her case she's saying oh well I'm going to fund these opportunities but there needs to be a way whereby there's opportunity out there that she can create without having to pay for it so maybe it's a case of just bringing seven people in a room in order to exchange an idea and then after the back of that idea they're going to sell it back into something and then what they then gain from that everyone gets a piece do you know what I mean so I think it's about being able to um, structure something in a way whereby you're not putting so much into it to get very little return actually what you need to do is over deliver at first because at, like I said at the beginning of me starting the network it was just me constantly sharing all the events that I had constantly sharing all the reports that I saw and that's a lot of time but essentially it was only me doing it because the trust had to be there so I think it's about being able to understand at what point are you ready to then sell it in and at what point are you also ready to charge because there's no point charging if you don't fully understand what you're delivering for these people and giving a, as a value so for me personally a lot of people have said oh why don't you charge the guests da, 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 da. I don't think it's at pace to be constantly be taking everyone's money like that because actually you could be a part of it and you might not even take an opportunity for a month so then but you pay a monthly subscription so then you feel like oh well I've just lost it all because I didn't even take an opportunity this month so what does that do for me so I think it's about being able to have that consistency so to that point it's more about building your own network listening to people going back to my first point and what do they actually need and what is this going to cost me is it going to cost me my time is it going to cost me money is it going to cost me the case of me bringing in other people in order to skill swap in because i think there's a there's a there's a thing about being able to understand what value looks like beyond money obviously as a business yes we need to create it but there are other things within the business that we offer as a value which is why people put them put, put into it i mean my friend my friends are up here i'm just going to put you guys on the spot um, Ibrahim and Jide, who they work at, what well, they founded Guap. And at first, when we were like starting out, I was just volunteering, but it was an incredible platform. And I just thought, wow, me putting into this, but I got so much out of it because then people trusted me. I built a network of music people, people in fashion. And then when I brought that, I brought that back into my network. And then that enabled me to then charge for my services. So I think it's about being able to understand what is it that you're actually giving and then what is the value that you're taking off the back of that so again back to your friend's point is she saying oh the only way that i can um the only way that i can build a network on this community is if i have money to put back into that i think she maybe needs to rethink what she's actually building masterclass from shani there <laughs> <laughs> the other thing about your <laughs> the other thing about your friend is well she should be here really uh, and and there's like but this is all being filmed to take some notes and this is a network right here and over here oh i'm sure it is yeah no i'm sure it is yeah. i'm sure it is i'm just saying that like it it's it's hard when you have to just rely on one thing yeah. do you know what i mean it's like about having a, a multiple scope on how you're building something rather than just one but this literally is a network you know plug into it um questions yeah, I've got a mic down, down here, please, for Karina. I've got a couple online as well, so if you've asked online, don't worry, I'm going to get to them. Hi. Um, I'd just like to ask, how do you um, imagine your networks will be sustained when you are no longer at the centre of it? Sue. Facilitating it. <laughs> so, I didn't... Just give me your Karina. I'll, I'll be thanking <laughs> you later for that one. You, you said you were going to ask it. Um, it has to be beyond the individual. I mean, otherwise it's non-sustainable. And how is it? Because the structure exists. That it, it, because it's not about me. It's not about, it's what I believe in and that's what I bring, but it doesn't exist because of me. It exists because of the people that are on it, because this, because Really? Of, if you were like unplugged, it's still... It'd be absolutely fine because it, what it sits in is the values of the young Vic. It sits at the center of who we are as a theatre, in terms of our vision, in terms of our mission, in terms of now it's become embedded in that it's part of the business model. It's kind of how we raise money, it's how we get artists to make some of the work, it's how we get ideas, how it feeds into taking part. You sort of yeah, make okay. it be part Basically. of the organism of an organization. If it sits at the side, yeah, the person leaves and it's dead. But I really don't think that if I left, it would disappear. But that maybe that's a, a time thing as well. Maybe in the first year or two years, if you left, it would have disappeared. I mean, I think Audrey is quite early on. And I imagine if you weren't involved in your network, it would. I think so. And 
I'm having the difficulty now because I'm always, you know, like in another country and I'm not always in the UK. So I'm really trying now to find really like the right team. Um, I've been working a lot with freelancers, but now I just feel like we need to have the team that is going to be full on on the network because unfortunately I cannot be like 100, 200 person like I was two years ago uh, because of other ventures. And that's the sort of thing with network, like we built a network, but then from the network, other opportunities are coming from, and this is really what happened. Um, but I still think like the network is going to like grow. What I'm trying to do now as well is to make sure that the creators, they come as well with their own ideas, their own project, and then we can work with them. Uh, to get back at the question of funding as well, um, I invested for the first year my own money and with the network, like I didn't get any money from this year. It's a free subscri subscription. I didn't want anybody to pay any events. Everything had to be free. Like that was really like what I wanted. Um, and yes, and it was maybe not sustainable at the time, but this is also how I wanted the network to be. And then from there, I had to review to the business model. Um, instead of asking creators basically to pay and we could see the brand, that's just why I'm, I'm creating it down like a creative agency. You want to work with creators, you have to pay for the work that the creators will be doing. And now it became like a, 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 a business basically, Black Creators Matter is a business. And, um, and that's how it became sustainable and profitable. Um, but yes, to your point, I need to have basically like a study team that could be there and then work all, all the time. I can do business development, we can do like the creative part, creative producer. Now it's really like per project based, but I feel like having one person and I do think I have this person to be fair. Uh, yeah, I do think I, I have this person. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think Sue, Sue's, uh, yes, Sue's answer and, is, you know, it's got to be uh, yeah. I think another, it, it's a really challenging tussle for organizations because what we definitely see is people trust people, not brands. So it's around 10 times the response on posts that are posted by individuals at a brand as opposed to the brand. So we always encourage brands to put people at the front. And so that does pose a problem when people leave. That's where empowering community leaders across different parts of the organization and the actually building a community comes in because it's less reliant on one individual within a company. But companies have to be very aware that it's weird being in a community sense and you're being talked to by a company, not an individual within a company. And actually, I'm going to be doing a shout out for the amazing crew at Guap as well. Um, <laughs> uh, they've done this really well. They've got a community um, which is a creator community as well, but they've got an amazing woman who's running that and that's the face of their community. And I think that they've done that brilliantly well. So it is always a challenge that if people leave and that's where just having multiple people and a community helps. Um, and so. also important to have your employees so they don't leave. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, a, this is an online question from one of our colleagues online. I just wanted, and I'm going to aim this one at um, you, Jack. This is from Roberta. How do you ensure the network is as open as possible, but also have criteria so it is filled with talented people and ideas? So the question is, open to all and high quality. Is that possible? Yeah, so this, I think, also maybe allows me to respond to the question about funding. It, it has felt from the beginning with what we're trying to do incredibly important that we be as open as possible. And for that reason, we are not a membership organization. You know, I think of us as a network more than, say, a membership organization. It does not cost anything to join our campaign. Anybody can do it for free. And that is, again, like key to who we are and, and our that's values a big change and what we're to how it was. trying to do. Yeah. yeah. But we obviously do need uh, some funding. We started our campaign with zero pounds and zero people. I remember in the beginning sending an email to our kind of volunteer group saying I need 120 pounds for a web post or something. And I remember someone saying, I'll give you, I'll give you 20 or 50 if you can't find the rest or something in response. So people will, you know, people will in the network if they believe in it, if they want to help you start it, people can be amazing. And I found uh, you know, though I had to kind of get used to it, just being honest and asking people. If they couldn't help, they couldn't help, and they said so, but they maybe pointed me in the direction of somebody else who could. Um, so that was key. In terms of how you get um, high quality people, I mean, for us, 
the, the, the most important criterion in people who join our campaign is that they share our belief that the arts make life better and therefore they should be available to everybody. And uh, that's it. If people believe that and want to work with us on that basis, they are very welcome to join our campaign. That's it. Great. You're very good at campaigning as well. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Um, By the way, I'd like to add to that as well. Quality is very different to different people. So I think sometimes people say, oh, we need to have this great quality. But we found that with all the companies that have ever used the dots, one person's or one company's definition of quality is very different to another. So I think actually just making things accessible is better than necessarily your what your definition of quality does tend to then make things inaccessible. Yeah, OK. Um, Unless you really are a god of quality. <laughs> also, does, making things more accessible doesn't just mean you're going to get people who aren't, who aren't yeah. high quality. Like, there's often this sort of yeah, false exactly. dichotomy between, yeah. like, oh, if, if we're really accessible, we're just going to get a load of, like, really crap people. Like, no, there's, like, there's not, it's sort of, it's a false dichotomy. Sometimes, actually, by reaching out and bringing people from people you haven't engaged with, people from all sorts of different backgrounds, you can actually find all sorts of either different quality or different sort of backgrounds and perspective and experiences that actually can enrich your organisation and enrich your network um, rather than negatively impacting it. And while I've got you, Jamie, this is a question from Cecile. It's a good question because it's something we haven't discussed. And it's my fault we should have discussed it, actually. But how do you measure the impact or success of a, a good network, qualitatively or quantitatively? Especially for things like It's a really good question. It's, you know, yeah. what, 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 where, is, what are you, where are you judging the value? I think it comes back to some, what you are saying, Pip, um, and the conversation about um, how people have value from their networks. Um, the people in the network should always extract more value from being in the network than they put into than they put into it. I think. And if the network, Is that right? I think, yeah, I think if you're if you're get if you're not if you're not getting any value out of your network, what's the point in being in it? In a, you know, you're not just there for fun. And so, the, 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 essentially, the way I sort of do it is I like to make sure that people who are involved in either my association or my, my organisation, they feel like what we are doing has added value to what they're doing and it's worth it for them. Mm. Um, and again, if, if there's an organisation that that's asking someone to pay subs on something, if the value they get from being part of that organisation, they deem to be less than the value they're paying for yeah, that, yeah, yeah. They shouldn't be a member of it. Like it's not adding value. And actually, it shouldn't necessarily be. I'm running a network, or I'm running an organisation. I'm going to work out if my organisation is valuable. If you're building your network, if you've got more people coming and saying we want to be part of this, we want to be part of it, then your network is by by definition succeeding. Which I suppose is qualitative. Qualitative, but, but it depends because everyone, everyone, everyone's got a different reason for wanting to be part yeah. of a network. But then that, if you have a digital solution, that's where quant comes in. So a healthy network, you want of engagement at least twenty to sixty percent. I know that's a massive broad network, a massive, yeah. but it depends kind of on the purpose of the network as well. But looking at the quant of engagement, because if someone's not getting value, they're not going to come back anyway. So you can see the quant and the qual at the same time. Um, but yeah, I think surveys are really great. There's a brilliant product market fit survey that. I can share with people after this, which helps you with the qual and the quant. Okay, we've got one question, two questions. So we've got one, did you have a, yes, lady there, gentleman there. Oh, and the lady there, marvellous. So three questions, <laughs> Thank you. and then we'll, we'll be done, we'll be done in... I'm sorry. Four questions, four questions. <laughs> Great, well, I hope people brought sleeping bags. Um, <laughs> no, we'll, we'll, okay. be, we'll, be, we'll, be, we'll be brief. Um, please, yes, the question. Right, so the question is, it's really interesting because what you're saying is sort of the dynamics of networks being very outward and, and, and bringing value in by being very outward and getting that engagement. And yet there's something about networks that's also got a dynamics of being inward in terms of servicing your group. And I'm particularly interested in how many of you are members or involved with the Campaign for the Arts. Because for me, that advocacy role to make the case for what we do is the most outward expression of all of our networks that we can uh, show publicly to those that matter in government. Should you take more, more questions at once? No, you know, okay. partner for that one, Jamie, go on. Second one? Yeah. It's great, I mean, basically I need to be much more involved with you. One of the big things I did, <laughs> no, no, I do. Again, I am... Um, UK music is an interesting one because you find yourself doing lots of different things at lots of different levels. So sometimes it'll be the internal internal forum convening within the sector. A big part of what I'm trying to do is winning the argument for the importance of the music industry. I mean, I love the fact we're doing it for the arts as a whole and I buy the argument completely. 
But there's the element of what can you be doing externally and fighting the argument for the music sector and the importance of music, whether it be music education, whether it be music and health and well-being, whether it be music for the economy or for tourism. Um, but then also sort of making sure that we're linking in with these organisations that are doing it more widely um, and making the argument, again, just before this, as a... a um, Oh, another network of the CBI. Mm. And it's fascinating sitting in a group where you're talking about the importance of the music industry and the challenges you're facing. And then next year is someone from the ceramic sector talking about the issues the ceramic sector is facing. And then the motor sector is over there. Mm. Um, but I think there's definitely a lot more we need to be doing to essentially win the argument. Because like I think we've seen in the last sort of few years or so, well, I always use this as, as an example, I'll be very brief. Fish, fishing people hate me because I always use, always use this example. Fishing generates £446 million a year for the economy and supports about 12,000 jobs. Music generates £5.8 billion, supports 200,000 jobs. If you look at the few, last few years, sort of like through Brexit deals and things, fishing was the one people were really, really, really worried about upsetting and sort of music just didn't really get a look in. And I sort of often look at us as a sector and say, it's our fault. We need to do so much more to win the argument for why we're important as a sector. We need to be so much more to win the argument to basically be showing look it's not just the economy it's not just the tourism um it's the it's the public i mean sort of on the schools um we did a little poll on this last year so if you speak to parents 55 percent of parents the quality of music provision at a school um is one of the first things i look at and one of the things they'll choose a school based on and actually there's, there's an element of actually making that argument to show that the public really does care about the art the public really does care about um, music and so sort of to the point you're making until you win that argument, often you won't get governments thinking we should be investing in music education because they won't be thinking it's a vote winner. You won't get governments thinking we should be investing in music in terms of supporting through the pandemic. But once you do win that argument, hopefully that starts to change. Well, if you... Yeah, I mean, just briefly, in terms of the, the outward and inward facing kind of impetuses, I think the thing that links them is is common ground, is the desire to find common ground. You go out to find other people who share your concern, you turn back in to the people who share your concern. And I think often about the fact that, you know, I, I, used, to, I used to work in a theatre, but I worked in a theatre because first I was a citizen who valued the arts. And actually what I'm interested in is, can we find more ways of drawing connections between what we might see as inward facing sectors or groups of people and everything else by recognising Yes, that the arts provides economic benefits from which we might all benefit, but actually also they provide personal and social benefits that unite us as human beings. That sounds a little bit wishy-washy, but I, I think there's, I, I mean that, I actually think, you know, there's a civic value. Yeah. Uh, I mean, here we are in the Barbican, you know, a building that kind of represents uh, the, the sort of post-war um, belief in that idea, that actually this is a, a thing that provides civic benefit to the public and therefore should be publicly funded. I think a lot of those arguments we need to make again and better, ideally with people, with the public rather than to the public. Good then, a very brief answer question. Are you all signed up to campaign for the arts? What I was going to say is though, I feel like being in advertising, and it's funny because I used to be in the performing arts as a dancer performer and going through the education system, which is a whole other conversation, I wasn't even told about campaign for the arts. So I think a bit about it is, is an education, just like understanding like there are these things that are accessible to you that are for you, that will make you feel like it's a safe space in order for you to get to the next place. Because if I was to say share it in the guest list, there might be definitely a few hundred people in there that will see that and like, I bet you they're probably seeing it for the first time mm. because there's a level of inaccessibility to a certain whether it be demographics communities where people come from etc where it's just not it's just not privy to them and therefore you just don't know what you don't know isn't mm. it so mm. I didn't know about campaign for the arts but I'm also aware that I'm very much within the advertising space, looking at brands and what brands are doing and organisations are doing, rather than what looking at the performing arts sector is doing or what the fishing sector is doing, do you know what I mean? <laughs> Hence why I wouldn't know all those stats. So I think there is something about being able to like come out of the silos that we're working in because there's probably also a lot of bodies, funding bodies, etc., that people probably wouldn't know that are accessible to them in music or in advertising, mm -hmm. but actually you can come from any creative discipline. So I think it's about being able to bridge the gap of the education around it and where is it accessible for people who are often in communities that you might not be talking to. So I'm not a part of it, but I will be. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so we must have... It's a good chance for us to work out what, what are those other networks which are probably working towards exactly the same aims as yeah, we are. Exactly. Actually, there's all those sort of shared agendas where it's actually much more helpful if we're teaming up aligned. and working and, and aligned and how can we basically 
form much closer bonds across these different sectors and okay. networks? Thanks, Jane. We're going to go for short answers, uh, if, um, but make the question as long as you like. OK, I'll make it really short. Um, we've talked a little bit about um, dormant members of networks um, and the percentage who are actually engaged. Um, I just would love some comments about how you view those kind of lurkers, those quieter members and what the relationship with them is and, and how you view your uh, servicing of those members, I guess, because they're choosing to stay in that network, even if they're not choosing to participate. Sue, how are you on lurkers? Well, I'm a lurker. <laughs> uh, I think for me, if you're on a network, use it how you use it. I'm not there to measure what your use of it. We've got over 2,000 people, not everybody's active, but maybe they really want Young Vic tickets for free. Maybe they just want to, you know, not get a, get a sense of what's happening, and that feeds into their knowledge and that gives them a sense of security and ownership and community. So I don't think you, for me anyway, I was reading up about networks for and the, the work networks kind of make it sound so hard like you're out there and you're kind of grafting and moving and shaking and all that kind of thing. I think being part of a network is just finding a place that you feel comfortable and if you feel comfortable lurk, lurking, <laughs> then lurk away, that's fine by me. So a pro, a pro lurker. Um, and lurkers aren't necessarily bad if they're active lurkers, sorry there's a very big difference. Um, there's lurkers that aren't even opening your email. But then there's, um, and so, yeah, act, like active lurkers are great. Let them be introverted lurkers, um, but it's the non-active lurkers. So it's much, it's the most important part when you start a network is when they first sign up. If you get someone to use something 10 times, it becomes a habit. And that's much easier day one, two, three to day seven. Once past day seven, it's much harder. And it's really hard to re-engage people once they've chosen. Okay, brilliant. This gentleman here, please. And then lady down here. Thank you very much. Fascinating conversation. I had a question more about a kind of future of networks because um, to lesser or greater extent, all of you use technology to build those networks. And I think Sue mentioned there's Facebook before Facebook uh, in terms of how it works. I think Shani mentioned that there's kind of online element and then people take it offline. I think Audrey, you mentioned that you're the only person here, at least in this panel, that try to build a network across geographic boundaries. And do you feel that you know going forward and i guess there is a difference between campaigning and advocacy which kind of uh, tries to challenge the status quo within a certain legislative framework or a regulatory framework on the one hand and on the other hand let's say a metric that is about self-development of its members and collaboration between the members do you feel let's say more on the self-development side or perhaps in advocacy as well it will still be the case that at the end of the day, the most sustainable networks will be the ones who have that face to face element where you have take the conversations offline and you meet uh, in real life, shall we say, or through your use of technology, you're going to have more and more networks develop developing across geographic boundaries where it's digital first, essentially, and people connect online um, through existing channels or let's say 20 years from now maybe via metaverse or whatever that might look like that's a really good question and it re actually reflects another question we got from um, people watching online is is how how important is in real life uh experiences within a network to keep it to keep to give it the dimension give it another dimension people value i think the real life is really important meeting people in real life i saw the difference we started the network in 2019 and then a year after it was the pandemic and we had to change a lot of things around. So we tried to do events online, like masterclasses. Uh, I was so sad because I saw like 10 people only were attending my events on Instagram Live. And then people basically like, when we had events, it was always sold out. So there was always a discussion, people like really, because it's for me, I call it a network, it's, just, it's really a community. And they had to be together, they had to talk to each other. So being online was a bit difficult. Um, I tell you, I'm always in a plane trying to be in a different country to try to meet creators and creatives. So um, I'm doing it. Um, but I feel like the online, I'm not really techy like Pip. I'm sure Pip has found a solution. Uh, but I just feel like for us, you know, it's really like meeting and um, and this is where I want to get back at it. Uh, the social media platform, this is where it all started. But at the moment, for artists from my platform, it was died down. And I know a lot of things have changed with Instagram, YouTube, the engagement is different. Um, 
we used to post like three years ago, we had a thousand people liking a post. We posted yesterday, we had for like three likes. So I was like, what's going on? <laughs> um, but um, so, yes, yeah, so what works really well uh, is the newsletter. I just realized that we can use later with all the information, everything that you want to basically like showcase or, or the project works much better for to our creators. But um, and we need to find new ways. I'm also a part, so I mentioned, I'm a part of the Young Vic, I'm a part of uh, the guest list and the dots. And, uh, and I'm reading the emails, I'm, I'm trying to be re really active. Sometimes I'm also like not the most active, but I'm trying to also go to as much as events that I, I can, because this is also the power of network is also the people that you meet and they're going to introduce you to someone else. And then being in, in this, I don't think I've ever started a network if I have not met people face to face. Okay. Okay, thank think, you very much. I'm oh, yes. sorry, I was just going to yeah, say, can. I think it depends on the objective of the network and mm. the objective of the individual. And then I also think that it, it depends on where you're, like what that, what that consumer journey looks like, because Ultimately, if you're trying to build something digitally and it only needs to exist digitally, the objective is digital, then yeah, you, you may not need to meet people and see, but if you're trying to bring something to life, meet new people, maybe where your starting point is, is digital first, because it's easy, like you said, you can broadcast, you can put it out there, you can quickly respond, etc. But then in order to actually execute the idea, or in order to actually get to where you need to be based on the objective, you probably need to meet that person, like, you know, vet that person, really understand what that looks like, how does that collaboration going to work, what's the consistency of it. So I think it's about being able to understand what the objectives are, but I think they can coexist. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Shani. Like, final question, and then uh, I think there might be booze. Hello. <laughs> uh -huh. I, I think my um, question actually um, leads on really nicely. Um, so, hi, I'm Jess. I work for a leader company, which is also a registered charity called Cardboard Citizens. And our membership um, is people who have lived experience of like homelessness and poverty. Um, those people sometimes have little or no access to um, anything digital. So I just wanted to know, like from your perspective, like how we can like in a like increasingly technological mm. society like how we can make sure that we don't leave people behind and how we can bring everybody with us okay in real life networks who wants to take that on i think it, it's, it's difficult but i do think that's when it becomes more a collaborative experience of bringing in partners and organizations that can support the mission to give those people the experience that they're missing out on so for example like a barbican <laughs> where they have space and you know they have shows or um, they have uh, safe safe places for people to get together in real life and then there's people like yourself that work in the background that have access to things like this to be able to be the facilitator of that because the reality is like those people are often not necessarily missed but they go unheard or they don't always feel represented and, and they often don't feel like they belong in spaces like these so it's about being able to have somebody that's always at the forefront and um, almost like an ambassador that represents them and then has those partners around different spaces that can connect them because i feel like and to your point pip people trust people not brands and businesses right so it's about being able to have advocates advocates or um, ambassadors that have partners with organizations or places that also believe in the mission and then that can bring that people in in order to have that experience and then hopefully change their life trajectory brilliant and thank you jess and we should know uh, the carbon systems and the barbican as Chani was saying is something which is entirely possible we should have a discussion well, there we go. Yeah. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we're, we're, we're out of time. Um, thank you so much for, for being here. Thank you so much for your contributions and questions. Thank you, everybody online who, who's been there as well. I think it's been a fantastic conversation. Um, and I, we must thank um, uh, Genesis Foundation for supporting this conversation and these cultural conversations. So I think they really add value. A lot of this will be boiled down into one page, which is maybe about almost like a masterclass about how the do's and don'ts of setting up a, a network. But mainly, I'd like to thank our, our panel, uh, Sue, Audrey, Shani, Pip, Jack, and Jamie. Could you give them all a whopping round of applause? Is there a wine there? No? No?
So that's it. That was great. Just uh, th these guys all here. So if you want to network, <laughs> you know, just hang around and stay around. Um, otherwise, uh, the pubs are open to about 11 o'clock, I think, aren't they? Um, thank you very much for coming. I hope you've enjoyed it. Okay, thank you.